Adding a methyl group to mescaline made it two to three times more potent, which was an observation that led Alexander Shulgin to synthesize all six possible regional isomers to investigate their activities. The general route to amphetamines like these would be the condensation of an aryl aldehyde with a nitroalkane in a Henry condensation, then reducing the nitrostyrene that you get with a powerful reducing agent. This is fine if the starting aldehydes are commercially available, like these compounds highlighted in green, but if we want to make TMA5 or TMA4, we start to have problems. Looking at Sigma Aldrich's website, the best thing they can do is sell us this compound for £1,500 per gram, and it's missing a methyl group. For TMA4, it's even worse, a pound per milligram, and it's not even in the right oxidation level, and transforming that acid to an aldehyde is something we'd rather avoid doing. These availabilities reflect the situation in Shulgin's time as well. If a compound isn't cheaply available, it just means there's no economic way to produce it on an industrial scale. So you have to make it yourself. The first reaction on the route towards TMA4 is a reaction of peracetic acid with 2,4-dimethoxybenzaldehyde. A nucleophilic attack is the first step, then the oxygen pushes its electrons back down, and the entire aryl ring migrates across the carbon-oxygen bond. Acetate is the leaving group in this migration reaction. Some of you will have already recognised this as the Bayer-Villiger oxidation, and the product in this case is an ester of formic acid, which can be hydrolyzed with aqueous base. This has homologated the aldehyde group into the phenolic hydroxide. The hydroxide group was reacted with allyl bromide, and you could draw the mechanism in two ways. You could either draw the SN2 prime like this, or the direct SN2 mechanism like this, and you can't tell between them unless you have some sort of carbon-13 label, and it doesn't matter. Once you've installed the allyl group, heating to 215 degrees Celsius induces the Claisen rearrangement, and the allyl group is transferred to the ring. Loss of a proton and enolization restores aromaticity. Once that's happened, methyl iodide was used to convert the phenol group into another methoxide group, establishing the methoxylation pattern that was required. The double bond was now isomerized using a huge excess of potassium hydroxide in ethanol. This happens because the base can deprotonate at this benzylic position. Looks unlikely, but you get a nice doubly stabilized carbanion with two resonance forms, and the second resonance form can protonate at the end of the conjugated system to give us the more substituted double bond that we want. And once the double bond has been isomerized, reaction with tetranitromethane installed the nitro group. In solution, tetranitromethane is in equilibrium with this trinitromethyl anion and the nitronium cation, which is electrophilic enough to be attacked by the double bond. It attacks in the position that gives you the more stabilized benzylic cation, which reverts to a double bond again with the loss of a proton. And once you have the nitrostyrene, it's time to reduce it with everybody's favorite reducing agent to give us TMA4. Tetranitromethane is a bit of a weird reagent, and it's worth looking at. It was first synthesized back in 1857 by Chikov, and then Chataway improved the process considerably in 1910 by reacting acetic anhydride with anhydrous nitric acid. The anhydrous nitric acid can protonate itself in an equilibrium, then the H2NO3 breaks down into water and nitronium cations. These nitronium ions are attacked by the enol of acetic anhydride. The first nitration happens like this, and then the electron withdrawing character of the nitro group enhances the reactivity, so eventually you get three nitro groups added. Water from the previous equilibrium can now come and break down the mixed anhydride, giving trinitroacetic acid as the intermediate. Over the course of one week, this is transformed into tetranitromethane. A decarboxylation is easy because of the electron withdrawing nitro groups, and then the intermediate nitroform anion picks up a final nitronium cation. Tetranitromethane can form unstable, highly explosive mixtures with even trace contaminants, and so using it has the potential to be quite interesting. As for TMA5, 1,2,4-trimethoxybenzene was lithiated with N-butyl lithium, and it lithiates exclusively in this position because it's stabilized by chelation from the methoxide groups. And the organolithium reagent reacts like a carbanion and picks up propionaldehyde to alkylate the ring. The hydroxide group was changed for bromide by reaction with phosphorus tribromide. The intermediate will look something like this, and then bromide will displace the phosphorus oxygen species, which is quite a stable leaving group. And once the bromide was installed, potassium hydroxide and ethanol was this time used for an elimination to convert that to a double bond. And tetranitromethane and lithium aluminium hydride were used to uh, furnish the product in a process exactly analogous to the one we've just seen. You might think this would be a good aldehyde to use to make TMA6, but the entry in PICAL actually starts from fluorogluconol on the basis that it's super cheap and it's abundantly available and could never be regulated because it can be isolated from a huge number of different plants and natural sources. So the first step from fluorogluconol was to use methyl sulfate to convert all of the hydroxide groups to O-methyl groups. 
dimethyl sulfate is a highly reactive methylating agent. It'll methylate pretty much anything. It's a good source of what's effectively methyl plus groups. Unfortunately, it's bloody horrible, and no one likes to use it. It might be cheap to make, but it's also hideously toxic, and even if it doesn't kill you outright, things like that might make you sick, so it's best to avoid its use altogether. Fortunately for us, Shulgin survived, and went on to use the Vilsmeyer reaction to install a 4-mile group on the methoxylated fluoroglutinol. A reaction of POCl3 with N-methyl formanolide generates the Vilsmeyer reagent via this intermediate. Essentially, phosphorus ends up removing the oxygen from the N-methyl formanolide to generate something which is trapped out by the very electron-rich aromatic ring which is eager to react. and you can imagine how this sort of thing might hydrolyze during the aqueous workup. And once the aldehyde's been produced, reaction with nitroethane under ammonium acetate catalysis followed by lithium-aluminium hydride reduction gives us the final isomer in this series of analogues.